Hey, it's Chris, Leisure Games. Let's talk this week's Kickstarters and crowdfunders. I see you, GameFound, that have launched. But as a quick side note here, we're going to ramble, rant, and roll here. I think that's going to be the new catchphrase for the channel <laughs> because obviously I like rolling dice. And if you're subscribed and you've seen any more than one of my videos, I like to ramble and rant a little bit. So I think it's an apt description. As a side note, I think this is worth mentioning. I was going to put out a video a couple weeks ago on this, and I sort of didn't want to because I just didn't feel like the tone was right. But there's a lot of drama going on right now within our community, especially on social media. And a lot of it is not very positive and just kind of toxic from all sides. So as a side note, especially the community I'm trying to create here, I'm trying to really be inclusive and just, you know, supportive. And you guys have been very much so to this point. And I just want to encourage you to continue to do so and to just kind of make this a place where we can just be and be happy and be friendly and open with each other and even disagree in a civil and organized manner. And hopefully when we get to 1000 subscribers, we'll have a little bit of more of a place where we can do that. But I just wanted to put that out there because I think it's worth saying. So thank you again for subscribing. If you like this, if this is of interest to you, I ran across this on another person's Patreon that I thought was a really a unique way of describing what they're putting out as a content creator. It was more of a video game situation, but basically saying, you know what, I'm not going to try and gate a lot of content with Patreon or on other social media. I don't really use a whole lot of other social media, but I think uh, the Patreon is also a way of showing Netflix subscription costing a certain price or Amazon Prime costing a certain price. I view Patreon as a donation to the subscription of the price of my channel. And if you are ever willing to donate from that side of things, I look at it as an extreme positive and I'd like to put a few more just, you know, little things on there to really show you hopefully that I'm wanting to engage and create more. I'm not the best at it. I'll be very frank with you. Like I said, social media is not my strength. So the guys on there have been very patient with me already. But if that ever is any of inclination to you, let me know or just shoot me a message or just ask. The other side thing I want to say is I really appreciate the interaction and the consistency that you guys have been following me with because I don't do this often, but I look occasionally at other people's channels and where their numbers are at sometimes. And I intentionally don't do it very often. I very rarely look at my own numbers, to be very frank with you, except the subscriber count right now because we're inching up there. But like the views and things like that, I don't really pay attention to that. But when I have glanced recently, I sort of look at some other channels that are bigger than me, like even two, three, four times bigger than me. And I look sort of at their subscriber numbers and their view counts. And I just want to say I'm really thankful for you guys because it seems like even those channels that got like anywhere between like 1500 and like 3000 subscribers, their view counts are all like double digits or very low triple digits. And the one thing I have constantly been impressed by and overwhelmed by in terms of appreciation from you guys is that, you know, my view counts have been very consistent with the subscriber numbers, or frankly speaking, with some of these surpassing the subscriber numbers. I just want to say thank you for that, because hopefully these channels that I've I've looked at, a lot of these are getting uh, prototypes, getting publishers to send them things, and getting, you know, more engagement on that side. So I'm going to be trying to get that. But I guess what I'm trying to say at the same time is it feels like subscriber count somehow matters more to people viewing from the outside as an optic sort of thing rather than view counts. Because I see some of these same creators getting these things and obviously not the big ones you're not your dice tower not your man versus meeple your quackle up your board game co but some of the other ones and i go well you know why not me so hopefully we can get a little bit of traction that way too um i'd love to do some of that i'm gonna put a whole nother video out in terms of whether or not and and i because i want to gauge you guys i want to know what you guys want and so we'll we'll talk about that a little bit i'll come up with maybe a video later this weekend or beginning of next week, you know, talking about what sort of engagement, what sort of things you would like to see if I start to get some of those connections to the publishers, you know, paid previews, just previews in general, gameplay, game thoughts, reviews, what, where is the interest? Where are you guys going to prefer to see 
and how does that sort of vary? So I'm going to hopefully have a little bit more of an in-depth thought conversation ramble like this uh, in a separate video. So anyway, thank you. Uh, let's get on with things. I've been rambling for too long at the beginning of this video. This is not why you turned into this video. So let's talk Kickstarters and Game Founders that launched this week. Can I just say as a side note, you know it's sort of a big lull in the board game scene when you start to see a lot of the tabletop RPGs occupying the top spots because when the board game scene, especially on Kickstarter, is going, usually you'll see like three or four or even up to five or six of these top popularity slots as board games and not tabletops. You see pretty much five of the top six are all tabletops. So we're in this kind of lull. Radlands is the sole representative in the top six right now. Okay, so let's talk about this here. This is Elite, a tabletop strategy board game. Now, they are over a quarter of the way, almost a third of the way of the funding, uh, less than two days in. That's because the pledge levels are more expensive than I would have thought. And to be very frank with you, I have not heard about this game even prior to the launch. And so I initially made this video and I said, you know what, I'm not going to look at the rule book. It's not going to be worth my time. It looks like Risk with slightly different mechanics. I know the reason you guys like these videos is because I put a little bit more thought into them. So you know what? I went back and I redid a couple of these. And so this is one of the ones I redid. And the rule book here is a lot more complicated than it looks like. And I think that this is not funding because this page does not adequately illustrate how complicated this game actually is. This looks like a more complicated Euro game than it actually looks like a more complicated risk just on the surface. And you are one of these corporations and you are using resources, gathering, going up resource tracks and allocation tracks. And you have lots of different actions that you're going to be trying to do. There's three different ages that you're going to do. And they progress only when certain actions have been taken a certain amount of times. And none of that is really reflected very clearly or very thoroughly on this page and so I, I wish that they had had more of that information on the page that was in the rule book so people could see the layers of depth that is actually there because I was surprised when I read the rule book it's only eight pages long but there's more there it's definitely not my liking it's definitely too thinky when it comes to the layering upon layering and there's some take that so it's not going to be a lot of people's necessarily jive, but I don't think this quick synopsis that they give on here, especially with all of the tracking that you're doing and the various uh, tracks along the side of the board trackers, I, I don't think that it gives it the adequate summary of what this game actually is. And, you know, yes, the pledges are $100 from the premium level and you can get 160 if you want your picture in the game or an art print, and there's just not enough information on here to get more people, because I think if there was more of that, and you talked about how each of the three phases uh, differed, and what led to each of them differently, it just needs more on there, because I think this could be a lot better than what it's running for, especially for a game that I've never heard of that's already at $4,000, because let's be honest, $4,000, we look at $4,000 and we scoff at it, but for somebody who's never put a game out, for somebody that's doing this for the first time, that's impressive. So I give them a lot of kudos. And if this doesn't fund, I think you just need to make changes to the, the project page itself. Check it out if that at all interests you. It's definitely something I wasn't expecting to be covering. Next up is Bendata. This game is actually almost funded, even in the 24 hours that I had to redo this video. And this is a game all about birds. This is a really simple one to two player game. It has a solo variant. It's a two player game with dice and cards. It's not complicated, but it's got a little bit of strategy behind it. Enough to make you think, but not enough to make you prone to analysis paralysis. This is going to easily fun. And after I read the rules, I really understood why it's already funding and because it's really straightforward but there's enough nuance to give it some actual thought as a filler so again it's only a $15 game so you're almost at $4,000 with a $15 game again it's telling you something it's simple dice birds pick bird card play bird card score bird card get four bird cards game over I mean that's essentially all it is the top part of these bird cards tells you on these dice rows what to do. So this one says flip two blue. So you flip them to the complete opposite side. And then on the bottom, you're scoring a point per odd black. And so you're gonna have an option there of how you wanna manipulate the dice, 
but then how you also want to score. So are you going to take the one that allows you to manipulate more now this turn for a later turn to score more? Or are you going to take the one that's going to be giving you some more scoring right away? That's it. That's pretty much the whole thing. There's a couple advanced variants. You can do a solo variant, but it's a nice concept. It reminds me of the game Songbirds from, I think, a year or two ago in the complexity that is within the simplicity of how it actually plays. I initially, like I said, I blew it off and I didn't read the rule book and I just sort of gave this general overview, generic blah, blah, blah. And now that I've looked at it and I said, okay, I see why this is funding. This makes a lot of sense. There you go. Check it out, especially if you're looking for something very light and quick to play that you can just kind of, you know, hum through, but still have a little bit deeper thought behind. I think this, this is going to be well thought of when it comes to backers. Here is Fish and Ships. Again, this is one fish and ships that I didn't give enough due diligence. And I'm a little surprised this one isn't a little bit higher. But again, I think the aesthetic just isn't really probably appealing to some people. And to be honest, between the font used on the page as well as the rule book, it just looks a little bit overdone. I really, if you look at the rule book, it's just, you know, this font just needs to be turned down a little bit. It makes it just a little bit harder to read. And so just a slight minor point there, but it's a, it's a fast playing, take that style card game. And it's not terribly complicated, but it has a lot of ways to sort of attack and move cards around. It is basically a set collection game at heart. All you're trying to do is get five of your treasure cards, except you don't know what treasure cards other people are necessarily going for. And so what you're going to be doing is you have a hand of treasure cards and you're going to be attacking or playing cards in order to win battles against other people. And if you win battles, you get some of their cards. And so you can lock down your own cards onto your own field. For example, here, I'll pull up the, the gameplay. So you can see right here, the lockdown area. So, I mean, it's very straightforward. You can see this is the general, okay, one person, one person, you got your piles. And so you're going against each other directly. You have your secret goal card. So which treasure are you going for? Here's your lockdown stack with a stack ability. So a stack ability is a thing. Stack ability, stack ability. Anyway, uh, locked down pile, which is things that other people cannot get. Or you have the treasures as well that you're collecting. So what are you doing? It's simple. You're either attacking somebody, you're drawing two cards, you're playing a Skullduggery, which is basically a special ability card, and there's like a dozen of them. Or you're locking down that treasure card so that no one can steal it. Now, if you really want to discard two treasure cards from your hand, you can take two turns instead of one. It's that simple. you know. And you're attacking just by playing cards, and whoever has the most wins. How much you win by is how many cards you get from the other person. So you are then trying to get, but if you lose, they're going to take cards from you. So you have to be very careful. I don't know if this is a game I would play with two people. This would be a game that would be like more of a party-esque game with like four or five and just the random chaosness of it, sort of like a King of Tokyo with cards, if you will. I don't think it's for me, but again, I'll say this. I'm a little surprised it's underfunding. I think just a few small things could be done on here to show you know, a little bit less of this curly font just to make it a little easier on the eyes in terms of reading. Otherwise, I'm not really sure why it's not funding. I think it's just probably lost in the shuffle of all the other things. That's what happens sometimes. And so with something like this, if it doesn't fund, I think you relaunch, you make a few tweaks and you see what happens. So I don't think it's a bad game. I just don't know how balanced it would be if there are going to be some powers that are going to be drastically more powerful. And that's where watching more gameplay Having more people tested out is going to be the most important thing and just seeing what happens overall. Zentiles. Now, this is one that I sort of missed, but I knew was uh, going to be going after I did the video for last week. I'm actually familiar with this game because I believe this is a port from Japan, like it says. When I did my one order from Japan where I used a forwarding company and I got about six, seven games or so from them. This was one of the ones that was getting a lot of mention, not because it is, you know, massively, oh my gosh, this is an amazing game, but because people that say, I mean, it's like meditation as a board game. I don't really know how else to explain it. And the comments are very reflective of that. And it was very well thought of on the Japanese market in the first place. And the few American reviewers that I've seen it have also said sort of the same thing. But I don't think this is going to be a game for everyone based on the fact that you're doing more of a Zen meditation type exercise as a board game. But one thing I'll say about the Japanese board game scene, though, is 
the components sometimes are absolutely beautiful. Now, you're, I haven't looked at the price yet, but I'm going to guess that you're going to pay a premium. One, because the shipping tends to be a little bit more. Also, because they tend to not source out a lot of their production necessarily as much. And so the overall cost tends to be a little bit higher, especially when they're made in country. So let's let's take a look and see if I'm right. So, okay, $5. Okay, yep, you're funding that. $10, Zentiles to facilities. Uh, $15 retail pledge, $33 for the solo. There is the solo game version of this as well as the basic game. And you can see this is a $47 game for the non-solo version. And that gets you the stretch goals. The solo version does not get you the stretch goals. So $34 and no stretch goals. There you go. The bundle of the basic and the solo is going to cost you 76 bucks, especially if you want to get them. And especially in English or English rules, it's really hard to get them outside of Japan or you're going to be waiting like three to six months even from the time of ordering and then you're not even guaranteed necessarily that they're all going to have English rules to begin with. So the fact that a lot of these bigger games are now getting Kickstarters and crowdfunding I think is great because again, this is something that in the uh, Western Hemisphere theme development that you'll never see. And so I think this is just an absolutely perfect game that encapsulates the culture and the theme there. You get self-affirmation. It allows you to just sort of express yourself. And, uh, you know, it just allows you to just sort of play with how you're feeling. It's more an activity and a reflection than it is rather a game in the traditional sense when we think of a game. But I think that's why it's done so well. It's also used as sort of a diary and a keeping track of things and just to bring some centeredness and some calmness. And that's why I think it's been so successful in the Japanese market. And honestly, it's beautiful looking. These stones are absolutely uh, fantastic. If this appeals to you at all, and as like I said, this is something that is completely different than anything we normally see, you should definitely check it out. That being said, obviously the price and the shipping are going to be the big barriers there, but it's something that's been on the market. So you can check out some Japanese reviews and you can check out what it is. And it's relatively a safe product. This is more of a pre-order for the English version rather than a campaign for a brand new game at all. This is already well established and well thought of. So there's plenty of information out there. So if it's for you, check it out. So this is Auction House, also thrown in with Cheese Factory by Gavin Birnbaum. If you don't know, he runs Cubico Games, which he does handmade wooden board games. He has done probably a dozen other board games in the past, all through Kickstarter, and he does them all, as it says, by himself, hand making these wooden components. And so this is the latest Kickstarter from him. It's a combination of two different games, Auction House and Cheese Factory, as I stated. Now, these are two very unique games, and he does games that are unlike any other. There is often a dexterity component to his games. If you're not familiar with them, it's worth checking out on Board Game Geeks. They are not very plentiful because he does hand make them. The quantities are often very limited. His Kickstarter projects aren't going for you know, 100,000, but they're reliably in the 10s, 15s, 20,000s by the time they end. But... They aren't long campaigns, and they are a little pricier if you want to get the game. I mean, Auction House is $70. Cheese Factory is $70. A combination of the two is $139. But you're going to get what you pay for with this game. Now, what are these games? Auction House is an auction-style game, and this is different than any of the other auction-style games that I've seen previously. You can see right here, I'm not going to go through the whole rules, but I'll give you a quick synopsis. But you can see that right here, all of the rules are right there. This is not super complicated. This is not 10 pages long. You're getting a game that has layers within the simplicity. And so that's why I'm a really a big fan of his games in general. But like I mentioned, you're going to pay more for them because he is hand making them all himself. In the past, he has customized them a little bit in some of the previous ones that allow for that. This doesn't look like they're necessarily going to have that element of things. But what are you doing in Auction House? Right here, you can see the board a little bit. Without clicking uh, too much into it, you can see that what you're going to have in this center pedestal right here is a lot that everyone contributes to, if I believe if I'm getting this correctly. And everyone gives one of their tiles as a value. And they all have values, I think, one to seven. And so you may give your two tiles. Somebody else may give their seven tiles. Someone else may give their five tile. Only the person that is the auctioneer, and you take turns rotating who's the auctioneer, knows the whole stack. And so as the auctioneer, you are the only one that knows the total value of what's in the pile. But everyone else is going to be bidding, and they're going to hope that they can bid for less than what the pile is. 
they're hoping to make a profit in that way. So if the total sum of the numbers in the pile is like 25 and they get it for 18, well, great. That's more points for them in the end. And so you rinse and repeat this until you go through all of the rounds and you have a winner. So it's, it's a very different, unique style of things. The other game, Cheese Factory, again, this now is the one with the dexterity component. This is one that I think is a very unique concept. It is much more abstract, and if you like chaos, this is maybe going to appeal to you. If you do not like chaos, you're not going to like this one. Because this one, literally, if you can't read this, it says, bouncing the ball on the table. And so there are pieces on the board that are considered both the mouse and the cat. And in the center, you have cheese. So here you go. You can see in the picture here, the yellow is the cheese, the orange are the cats, and you are each assigned two mice, one of each color. So one person may be the green and the pink, the other person may be the red and the blue. And you can either on your turn, move a mouse, move a cat, or bounce the ball. And the bouncing the ball is literally bouncing a bouncy ball off of the table or the surface over here onto this, which is allowing you to move these pieces. And it is an actual gameplay element. So if you can knock something into each other, you can definitely influence the game in both a positive and a negative way. The turns are very simple. You have two action points. You can use one of your action points to move one of your mice. You can move any cat or you can bounce the ball. You're only trying to get three points to win. Mice and cats can only move orthogonally though. So you can see right now that it's going to get very tricky. How do you score? Simple. You get your mouse to touch the cheese. Nibbling the cheese gets you two points. If you can make a cat catch one of the other person's mice, you get one point. That's it. And then it's a spatial, it's a strategy, it's a tactical nature, and it's a little bit of chaos thrown in with a bouncy ball. So it's something completely unique, and that's why I love his games. I have one of his other games, Karoo, and this is Karoo. I can't find it on the market. I bought mine as a bin on the auction on Board Game Geek, and I've never seen anything like it. It's sort of like bocce ball, only with cubes that you're shooting off of the side here onto the center, trying to get it as close as you can uh, to the bouncy ball in the middle. And the bouncy ball moves, and you knock the bouncy ball off for extra bonus points. And it's just, it's a blast. I play it with the kids. My Both my kids have been playing it for over a year. And... <laughs> They win just as much as I do. So that is the type of game that you're sort of making. And each of them are handmade, like I said. So there are some imperfections. But you can tell that there's a lot of effort and quality put in with this. I think with Karoo, for example, there are only 96 of these owned on Board Game Geek. So I have one of the 96 copies. And if you want this, you're just not going to be able to probably get it. There's no secondary market for this whatsoever. Uh, check it out if this is of interest to you. Nice to support something like this because that's what everyone always says Kickstarter's for. Next up, we have the Board Game Geek. Now, this is nine years. He's done nine campaigns. That's crazy to me. I don't see him as much around Board Game Geek with his stuff. Maybe that's just because of the stuff I'm looking at and the stuff he covers. I don't know how big of overlap Venn diagram sort of situation that is. But he's been doing it for a while. I know he's sponsored by Miniature Market as well. You see Miniature Market on a lot of his videos. And he's just doing, I think, just a big... You get a bunch of promos for a big bunch of money. And, yep, $50, $50 gets you all of the promos. And then there is a resource pack. And then he also does all of these, which I don't see a lot of these other guys do. He really does have a lot of publisher support for these one-time off packs. And I won't go down here, but you can just see all these publishers put out these one-time packs here that they can do as bundles and that are basically sponsored. And you can see that they're relatively well thought of and people are willing to support as well to get a game at the same time because this is all the ones that are done. So he never nearly raises as much as some of the others like Man vs. Meeple or Dice Tower, but you get some more promos, you get some more of just games that are going to be supporting him in the first place. And so you can see just tons and tons of bundles and games. Again, I'm not a completionist. I really have a hard time doing it for bundles of promos, but... If you want to support someone and get something back at the same time that's more tangible, here's another way. I saw this pop up. Again, something completely under my radar. Didn't know about it at all. Kickard's Goal. And this is basically a 1v1 soccer playing-esque card game where you each play a card and you determine what happens with the ball. You're choosing your attack. Your defender responds. There's special conditions that you can play. And you determine whether or not you're making a goal. And it's nothing overly complex. It's nothing overly the top. 
but it's just straightforward. It's very unique. They've got good art and good design there. And it looks like the theme is very well incorporated with everything from uh, yellow cards uh, to the video assisted review. So they've really done a good job of incorporating it. You can really kind of get a good gist of what's going on in this game. So I like it. Again, it's not going to be my sort of thing. I don't have anyone in my household that's going to be intrigued by this theme. My wife isn't going to have a whole lot of uh, interest in this, and my kids aren't old enough because this is a little bit more complex, as you can see here with the cards. You know, depending on your distance and your location, something different happens with the action. So there are elements. There's a lot of strategy here in terms of playing these. It's just probably something that I don't have a whole lot of interest in, but it's something completely unique, and I like that we're seeing this because... This is something, again, that I don't think you're going to see elsewhere. And this doesn't strike me as something that's going to be widely available at retail. So if you're looking for a soccer game, I know a redo version of one of the big soccer manager games that sort of flew under the radar, you know, maybe a decade ago. That's going to be on Kickstarter later this year. But this is something unique. This is more of a 1v1 as opposed to that game, which is more of a generalized manager. You're managing your team. You're managing your team through the cups and the individual games. And you're managing the roster. This is more, I do something you do something. I try and score, you try and block, what happens, vice versa, rinse and repeat. So more of like a dueling game. So if you like dueling games, if you're a soccer fan, this is probably worth checking out. It's already over twice its funding goal for a game I'd never heard of. So something must be striking true with people. So check it out. Now we have Box Dungeon. And this is basically your dungeon crawler with meeples with the bare essentials. So the early bird here, there's only one left, is the Box Dungeon. It's only $27, which is actually really fair price. The only question I have about this game is when I want to play a dungeon crawler, there are other things that I want to play non-dungeon crawler that will simulate it better. Or if I want to play a dungeon crawler, I'm going to want to actually play a dungeon crawler. And will this theme and will this minimization of it really scratch that itch, if you will? And I don't know. It's relatively straightforward. I mean, you, you do your hero, you got the dungeon and you go. So it's that's where its appeal is. So if you want something overhead, if you want something for the kids, this might be a better fit as a tweener that's still going to have a good amount of aesthetic while not being too costly for the wallet to see if your family or if your group is going to like this sort of thing. So it's a low entry point into the genre, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And they've got a whole bunch of things. And honestly, I kind of like the meeples. It makes it... it it fits, I think, the aesthetic that they're going for. The only question is going to be whether or not it funds. It's sort of, again, if one that flew under the radar, as all of these so far. So we'll get to the big boys here in a minute. But it's 50% of the way. It's got 12 days to go. It's not nearly as long as some of the other ones. But will it fund? I think it'll probably fund. And it says four dozen unique map cards to procedurally generate rooms, which is impressive. It's just... Is there going to be enough depth there or is this going to be one of those games where you play it once or twice and you've seen most of the stuff because there's only four consumables, there's only six equipment cards, and there's only 25 weapons. So if you're upgrading two weapons two or three times with two or three people, you've seen over half the weapons, you've probably seen most of the equipment cards, you've probably seen at least half the monsters. So does it have more than a time or two play? There is the DM side of things too, what you can play as a single player or the DM. And that's, I guess, the other thing is I'm not really sure that this is going to be a great approach for a lot of people because when we play these dungeon crawlers, we don't want to play with a DM necessarily. If I want to play with a DM, I'm going to go play Dungeons & Dragons. Is there room for this sort of tweener game with a 1v all essentially done in a different way? I don't know. I think you're going to see this and I'd be interested to see how this does if it funds, if it goes to a retail level. Obviously, expansions would be easy to do on something like this in the future, but I would almost feel like there needs to be more depth in terms of the variability and the amount of stuff you're getting, even though the price for the amount you're getting is relatively good. Okay, so now we're getting to the, the bad boys. As you can see, Forest of Radgost has launched. I am pledging. And so if you're skipping to this part of the video, I'll tell you right now, if you have any interest in this game... This is the biggest criticism I have of this page, and I'm going to show you right away so you can see it. And I'm not sure why they did it this way, or if I'm just, you know, missing it somewhere else on the page. So I'm not sure why this is literally two-thirds to three-quarters of the way down the page. I did not see it higher up, so if I did, I missed it. But otherwise, I'm not sure why this is there, why this is not being announced, why this isn't at the top of the page in bold font. And I only found it because I read through this page very carefully when I was trying to make this video for you guys. Important, backers who pledge by 
February 12 at this time received $5 off on the lower pledge levels, $10 for the divine pledge levels. So the high ones, so the $129 ones. It can be used for offsetting shipping. So they're not, they don't care how you use it, if you want to pay on the base or if you want to pay for the shipping cost, but it's there. I don't know why this isn't all the way at the top. Why is this not? Boom, where is this? I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. You'd think that that would just be plastered at the top. You know, first 48 hours, essentially, blast it. And I don't see it anywhere else on the page. So if you're skipping to this right now and you have any interest, there is essentially an early bird. So be aware. So let's talk about what it actually is. Slavic mythology. I know next to nothing about it. They don't go into great detail, but they talk about also offering a add-on that has a lot more of the lore that talks about a lot of the creatures that you're going to see. What is this game? Why is it unique? Why are people talking about it? Why is King of Average talking about it in such a positive way? Well, let me tell you. It's got 843 backers, which again, it's not a large amount. Now, I like the pledge levels that they've done though. I am pledging right now for the Acorn Pledge because this is the standee pledge level, and I like it. It's still, $64 was a lot more than I was expecting for a standee pledge level because the miniature levels are much higher. $99 for the basic miniature le pledge level, $129 with extra miniatures, marble dice, and a dice cup, a leather dice cup. So as you can see here, the King of Average quote, it's unlike anything I've ever covered, it's charm and character. And... The gist of this game, as I mentioned last week, is there are two children that fall asleep and get lost in this forest full of mythical creatures. There's this patron god, Radgost, who does not like anyone going in his forest. And so as much as the villagers are terribly terrified to stay out of the forest in general, you're venturing in there with your group. One person is the children. And you are the combination, you can get split up, but you're the combo of both kids. Now, this is where the game takes a little bit first different departure, is you can go out as a group. So if you play with four people, one person is the two kids, the other three are the other characters searching for the party. Now, you can choose to stay together as a group, your events um, slightly modified in terms of how you react to them, like in terms of an ability check or a stat roll, essentially, is what you're doing in this game when you encounter a creature. Or you can go separately and just use your own individual abilities. So there's blessing and curse of both of those. Now, where else is the difference in this game? It says, and this is the interesting thing, one to seven players, yep, just like I said, you know, you can all take your turn. And I wonder if there's going to be a little bit, since it's not simultaneous play, if 45 to 90 minutes is actively reflecting, especially at more than like a four person player count, I would mm, hesitate at that. I don't think it really probably would be that, but that's a side note. You have nine decks of cards that are going to be controlling things as you go throughout. So one of them, for example, the yellow deck is your starting equipment that is handed out at the beginning of the game. And what you're going to be doing is doing this through three days. And so each day consists of, I think, something like 14 creature encounters. And what you're doing when you get these creature encounters is you're placing them on this circular track right here you see in the picture. And as this fills up, it progresses through the day. The yellow being the daytime, the blue being the evening and the red being the night. You can do things during these first two phases. The last three are when the monsters solely are moving and you're sleeping, but they are moving and they have the potential to interact with you even if you're sleeping because they're just kind of going around. And I can't describe that in detail in a short amount of time, but if you're interested, check out the rule book. The other decks are mitigating all of those other things that I mentioned as well as the storybook, because you're gonna run into these different creatures, and before you get to see what the creature is, because when you run into the creature on the board, it is face down, and so before that, you have to decide, what am I gonna do, how am I going to react to this creature, because you have three different ways of reacting to the creature. Let's take a half step back here. How do you even get to the creature? And this is where the other interesting twist is. You're going to have a movement die that is different on each character, and you're also going to have a directional die. Directional die tells you, you either have to move left on the path, you either have to move right on the path, or you get to freely move wherever you want. And so that is different. And then the distance die allows you to see how far you can actually go. And if you do not encounter a creature, that's when you can explore, you can get other items, you can get other things to help you along the way. But if you run into a creature, then you can't. And then you have to decide, like I said, 
what you're going to do on those skill checks. So like I mentioned here, they hide their identity and they remain revealed afterwards. So someone else that is subsequently following you on the path, it is supposed that you have told them what you are expecting down the line so they can then choose the appropriate skill. But if you're the first person to encounter it, you're not going to know. So you may have to choose either. Am I going to run? Am I going to hide? Or am I going to strand and sort of talk and fight? There's no killing in this game. And they make that very clear. Killing is bad. Killing Radgast Wrath would be bad. So you can fight and sort of defeat it, but you do not kill it. So they talk about based on what you have seen previously, because as you're putting these tokens on that center day board, you can sort of infer what's left. And after you've maybe played a couple rounds or played a couple games, you can start to use a logical deduction of, okay, well, I know this guy's been played, this guy's been played, this guy's been played. So I'm guessing that this creature is going to be this guy. And so I know, that, or remember previously a little metagaming, that this guy was strong on the attack. So I am going to hide or run from him. And so depending on if you are in a group or in an individual, for example, the group gets a plus one to the fight. The hiding uses the highest hide of anyone in the group. So it is mitigated in a way of being beneficial in the group. But if you're in the group, you're going to have less time to go out and explore and less chances to get to the kids that you need to rescue because you need to get everyone, not just the kids, you need to get everyone back into the village by the end of the third night. And if you do not, then you fail. Or if you cannot get someone back, if someone is trapped out there and there's no way to get them back, you also fail. Again, as another aesthetic thing, I know that they're trying to go really with the theme here, but I can't read some of these letters sometimes. It makes it very difficult. I know they're trying to stay very true to it, but I can't necessarily barely tell what this actually says here. So there had to be in some font that was a little bit more easier to read because I'm kind of just skipping over them then, but the miniatures on this do nothing for me. The biggest concern I have with the miniatures, again, if you're a new creator making miniatures, how much is that gonna delay the project in general? And then the other concern I have is that down here, when we get to the stretch goals, and we'll come back to some of this other stuff that I mentioned, is that all of these stretch goals, all of a sudden, are all miniatures. So like, if I'm at the standee level, I'm just kind of SOL. It's kind of frustrating, it's kind of irritating, I don't know. And maybe they're going to explain that more if, you know, there's going to be another standee for those guys too. I, I don't know. Anyway, hopefully there is. Hopefully they're just saying, okay, well, we've already got the standee for this level and hopefully it's just a miniature that's going to be on top of it. So that's not too big a deal. Alongside of this, all of your characters are going to have their own personal goals. So you're going to be having a little bit of that to go on. Like I mentioned, the same decks. You're going to be going through these decks, but also the encounters. So the combination of the two is going to make a lot of unique situations that's going to not reproducible in any subsequent games, making each game unique. Here is the daytime, nighttime, evening sort of thing that you're putting the tokens out there, you know, as they've been encountered, the creatures. Because once you defeat the encounter in any way, it gets put on there. So then we get down to the bottom here. You have some videos by the Dice Tower, King of Average, and a few other ones so that you can get a better sense of how it actually plays. I was not expecting to like this. I did not like the initial appeal of the Kickstarter page in general. And then I read the rule book and I was much more intrigued. $64 is right around that breaking point price. If it was any lower, if we were talking 50, 50, five even for the standees i would be much more probably keeping it if it was any higher for the standees i would probably be immediately out but as is with this especially getting a discounted five bucks right now it's probably going to go down to the wire for me in terms of whether or not i'm going to keep the pledge i think it's worth checking out i was not expecting it to be this good and it's better than i expected so it's worth a glance descending the stairs I mentioned this one. This one is sort of a, an odd combination of an RPG and a narration sort of tabletop game. And so, you know, what are these stairs doing? Where are they going? And it's sort of yours to imagine. I'm including it because I mentioned last week, but it's really a Zine. So I, that's all I'm going to put out there because I, we didn't really realize what it was going to be. So there you go. It's one of the Zines that's popping up, but I won't cover it any further because it's not really fitting in with the rest of the games. But since I mentioned it last week, I just wanted to have some follow-up. Okay, so here is the one you have all been waiting for. This is Kingdom Rush Elemental Uprising. This is the big dog that sort of launched this week. And this is actually on GameFound, obviously, instead of Kickstarter. This is the second of the projects to ever launch on GameFound and sort of a big testing outside of the Awakened Realms internal organization. Lucky Duck Games, they just delivered sort of about probably four or so months ago, the first version of Kingdom Rush. It's been relatively well received. 
a few criticisms, especially on the essential portal tiles that people are very frustrated by that cannot be eliminated very easily. And what they've done is they have made this a standalone expansion with basically bosses, different elements, and new heroes. And they've said that it's completely compatible with the first one. So let's talk about it here. It's already at a quarter of a million dollars. It's going to be higher. I, I kind of like the stretch goal thing at the top. You've got all the big guys playing it with Rolling Solo, with Board Game Co., Man vs. Meeple, and Tantrum House. Except for the Man vs. Meeple quote, you could substitute these quotes in anywhere. And I know th that's just my personal feeling is the quotes never do anything for me. They're more of a clickbait sort of thing. Fully cooperative. And the biggest criticism I would have otherwise, besides the portal tiles for the first game, was it felt like a one to two player game. If you were at three to four players, it was more quarterbacking in terms of the cooperative nature than I would have liked playing it at a four player count that I did. I think honestly, by my initial impressions, if you're going to back one, and I'll tell you this right now, I would probably back this and skip the first one. I almost wanna sell my first one and just get this one and be good with it from that side of things. But the first one also has a lot of stuff with it. So I'm not sure I would quite do that. So what makes this unique? Obviously you have your heroes here. And so you can use heroes from the first one. You can use heroes from the second one. They're cross compatible. So what's new though, environmental elements. So basically helping you interact, making it more important for your hero to move around the map because otherwise, Heroes became kind of superfluous at times unless you were putting them directly on the tiles themselves, I felt like. And then you also have environmental hazards in the same right, something that may limit your movement of your hero because heroes can be very useful in stomping out difficult to reach or difficult to sort of fill exactly spots on these tower defense boards that are going through the path. And now you have elemental hordes. So hordes that are going to be tougher to get off of the board in the first place so that they can only be covered with each square of an attack so the for example you can only get one square per attack so you couldn't fill up this two by two all four squares with one attack like you could before you're going to have to have four people attacking so it's a way to sort of take the toughness of those portal tiles but also not make it incredibly tough because that was my biggest problem with the portal tiles is if you're not familiar portal tiles if you shot them with a cannon that cannon, that weapon, was completely lost to the discard pile. And so it made it very difficult to mitigate that when you have to shoot it like six times and you only have eight total towers. It's very frustrating, especially when a portal tile comes out halfway through the mission. Other bad guys, you have monster abilities that can shield themselves. Don't fear, the heroes get some new abilities. And I was kind of wondering about this, how they would make it, because you can't really do much more than the three cardinal directions in terms of where things are at. So they've added a little bit of variation in terms of you can either do this or this. Again, you can do this anywhere on the map versus one of these where with any orientation. So again, they've added a little bit of flavor there. I'm not as impressed just because I think there's less you can do overall from an attacking standpoint, but they've done a very good job. And if they've got all of the other ones in there from the first plus this, that it becomes more of a, okay, why would I get the first one? Tower modifications, you've got some other elements. Now this is where sort of people are wondering. They have announced that you can modify these towers and that was where the variation that I was not necessarily as certain about here comes in. And they've said that these stickers are reusable, but they're super special stickers that aren't going to have trouble going on and off repeatedly. And they've retested them and tested them and tested them and you get two sets just in case. <laughs> So they're really doing it. And honestly, they've been really receptive. They kind of had some production issues with the first campaign and they've offered a discount for return backers essentially for this one based on that. I've really been pleased about their responsiveness from a customer service standpoint. So that's the whole reason I'm looking at this because like I said, I'm tempted just to get this and sell my previous one, but I don't know. I wanna see how much more of this this has. So obviously here is the base pledge of $74. You're getting the more than shadows expansion and the base game with the deluxe upgrade. You're getting the retail pledge. If you're gonna get the retail pledge, that's always a tough one, but you're getting the free expansion with this. So that's probably making it a better deal regardless if you're interested in getting it in the first place. With the reception that the first one has had, if you can figure out some of the additional elements here, you can kind of get a good sense of which one is right for you. And frankly speaking, I think this one's probably more right for me. And I think that's partially the problem with Kickstarters and crowdfunders in general is that sometimes the second iteration, the 2.0 version is just that much better. And sometimes the 1.0 buyers and holders are left holding the bag a little bit, a little bit out of luck, either having to upgrade or stay with the one that might not 
not be quite as good overall. Sort of a buyer beware situation. Darned if you do, darned if you don't, right? So that is what it is. Here you can see some of the upgrades that they had in the first ones, the miniatures and replace the soldier tokens, some 3D upgrades, and then the 3D towers. I didn't have any of those from the first one. I had the spider goddess and the base game as well as just the upgrades that came with the storage solution from the first one. Here we go, you've got some already unlocked stuff, um, more ability tiles, more special abilities, more scenarios. So it's a solid, solid, solid. It's probably the best tower defense game out there. No doubt about saying that. I don't think you would go wrong with, if you want tower defense, this is tower defense done and ported to the tabletop scene right. This is unique. You're not going to see anything else out there like it. And it is a good game. But it's the question of whether or not it's a good game for you. Are you a solo gamer? Then I think this is going to be very, 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 very much up your alley. Because you can control all of the towers. You can even play two-handed. It's not super complicated. You can quarterback all you want. Two players, I think it works very well as well. Because you're going to be sitting there talking to your partner right next to you. Three and four... I would not feel strongly recommending this for three or four players. I just wouldn't. I did not enjoy it as much in three or four players than when I played it with just by myself. And that's with two people, my brother and sister-in-law, that I really enjoy playing a lot of games with. So we just felt it was more one or two people making all of the decisions and the other two people just going, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh yeah, that makes sense. I'll do this with my cards. And oh yeah, you should do that with your cards. Okay, okay. That is not to say that this is not a good game by any means. It is a very, very solid game. Here's all the stuff you're getting. I think the price point, even for the deluxe edition, $74 is really good. Here you go. You can see some of the enemies down here at the bottom, the boss, the Viathan, Elemenus, and some of the other stretch goals. So I'm not going to show you how to play. I mean, you're just putting your towers down, moving them around, shooting them, covering them on the board. If they're all covered, you take it off. If one gets to the end, you lose a life. If too many lives are lost, you lose. I mean, it's tower defense. It's not super complicated, but it's detailed and it ports it well. So I have no problem recommending this if this is of interest to you, because this is going to be one that I'm going to have to seriously think about whether or not I'm going to keep my other one, sell it, or get this one, or get this one on top of it. So this is going to be a hard decision for me. Given the fact that they're giving us a little bit of credit from the first one, I'm probably going to end up getting it. And then I maybe, if I sell the first one, I won't lose as much money. You've got all the big guys again. I don't know how they all have time to do this because they're on almost every single one. Here you go, Slicker Drip, Board Game Co. with, with Quackalope, and uh, all the other guys too. So <laughs> here you go. We'll see what happens. Anyway. So that is it. You're going to see more stretch goals by the end. And we are, what, how many days left do we have? We have 21 days left. So this is probably going to be close to a million dollars. I don't know. Will it slow down? Will it not? I think it has kind of slowed down. Maybe, maybe only half a million dollars. I think maybe half a million dollars is more approachable just because the Aeon's End effect too. Do people need both games? Are they going to be like me? Are they going to get the second one? Are they going to sell the first one? Because I'm not sure you need both. And I think that's probably the biggest detriment overall to this campaign. But overall, I like what I'm seeing. I hate to say that. <laughs> Gosh, this is going to be an expensive month. I think more expensive than I was planning. So there you go. That is what is on Kickstarter Game Found crowdfunding this week. A couple surprises. And you know what? You know, maybe we should recap, uh, you know, over the weekend, some of the stuff that's going to be ending soon or some of the stuff that I covered last month because it sort of falls under the radar. As you saw on the Kickstarter popularity page, a lot of that stuff has just fallen because I don't know if people are waiting or if people are just not backing or these zines are just, you know, overcoming and the tabletop stuff is just massive right now. But it's really interesting that none of them are at the top of the popularity list. So I'm not really sure what that says about things right now. Anyway, again, thank you for watching. Hopefully uh, my ramble at the beginning, my rant wasn't too much for you guys. Check it out over the weekend. The next day or two, I'm also going to be putting out the upcoming games for next week. <coughs> Bloodstone. <coughs> Bloodstone. And so we'll talk about that extensively. And we will just kind of see how expensive this month is actually going to be, which I'm not excited about. <laughs> and whatever else comes out, hopefully I can get one or two other videos out in the next couple days. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to do another this or that or the Kickstarter on a budget sort of thing. We'll see where the hotness is at the beginning of the week, if it's worth putting out another one of those Monday morning hotness quarterback episodes. So I'll, tr I'll try to give you some heads up. 
Otherwise, Patreon, maybe I'll post there and you can kind of get a preview of what's going to be coming. Would you like that? Uh, uh, see what I did there? See what I did there? Anyway, I'd love it if we could just hit, you know, a thousand subscribers before the end of the month of February. So let's see if we can do that. I think we're still needing to average like 12 or 15 pay, you know, subscribers right now. So I'm not sure if we're going to do that. But either way, if you like it, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. I like the comment section. Let me know what sounds interesting to you. Is anything catching your fancy? More stuff, I fair say, is catching my eye nowadays. And there's a lot more quality stuff coming out there on a daily basis. So watch your wallets. Stay classy. I'll see you around.